Welcome to Beyond Bite Wings, the business side of dentistry, brought to you by Edwards & Associates PC. Join us as we discuss how to build your dental practice, optimize your income, and plan for your future. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Edwards & Associates PC is not rendering legal, accounting, or professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information that is shared. At Edwards & Associates PC, our business is the business of dentistry. For help or more information, visit our website at enassociates.com. Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of Beyond Bite Wings. So Lynn, Robert, and of course myself, Ash, we're going to be talking about the popular topic of when to add an additional provider to your practice. Hot topic. It is, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I've been getting a lot of phone calls regarding this lately, and Which it's surprising. Is kind of, it is surprising during this pandemic climate right. that people are talking about this. Mm-hmm. Any speculation as to why, though? Pure speculation, but I think... People are really looking ahead and setting their goals pretty optimistically for the year, for this year. Mm -hmm. And as opposed to, so post pandemic now, they're planning on increasing their production and they're going to need additional providers to help them do that. Right. right, Whether it's a hygienist or an associate doctor. Mm -hmm. So when should they bring in a hygienist or an associate or which one should come in first or how, how do we, how should they decide that? Well, it really depends on where in the history of the practice they are. If it's a startup, they're Mm -hmm. not going to have a hygienist for the first probably four to six months, maybe longer. And there's a lot of resistance from doctors to hire hygienists just because of the cost involved. Mm -hmm. But what they don't think, all they see is cost. Right. They don't think about what the hygienist should be generating as far as revenue is concerned. Mm -hmm. And hygiene department should be generating three times whatever you pay them. Ah, I see. So that's the magic ratio there. Huh? That's the magic ratio. And if they're not doing that, then there's a problem with your hygiene department. But let's go back to the startup. When do they know, or how do they know when to bring in a hygienist? Well, it takes about 800 to 1,000 patients to support a hygienist full time. I see. So once they have a number of active patients, let's say, I don't know, 400, mm-hmm. And if you assume those are going to come for two hygiene visits a year, that's 800 visits. Mm -hmm. Divide that by 52 weeks to see how many hygiene days you have. I see. And once you have one or two hygiene days a week, then bring in a part-time hygienist. You don't have to bring them in full-time. Okay. Most hygienists that I talk to actually want some part-time work. Mm -hmm. Seems like they want to work five days a week. Some of them do. So they'll work four days one place and one day another place. Or if they're working two days one in one practice, they'll work another two to three days in another practice. Not at all unusual. Oh, wow. And hygienists are in short supply right now for, I think, more reasons than just supply and demand. But the pandemic has, I think, encouraged some of them to uh, either change occupations or just retire completely. Mm. Wow. And so I know a lot of doctors are having a hard time finding hygienists. I talked to one client, I don't know, a month ago, and he'd called the temp agencies, and none of the temp agencies had a hygienist to send him. Wow. Wow. That's really detrimental to a practice that needs someone in. Yes. So in these hard times, let's say a practice is looking for a full-time hygienist, is unable to get a full-time hygienist, but does manage to find someone who's willing to work one day a week, which day would you recommend for them to bring in the hygienist? It could be any day of the week, and if you're going to do it that way, what you've got to do is teach your front desk person to schedule accordingly. I see. So you would need to schedule that day heavily for hygiene, probably Mm -hmm. more than your typical 8 to 10 patients. It might need to be 12 to 15 if if you can cut the time interval down where they can see more patients or extend hours. And then it can be whatever day of the week that the schedule is filled. I see. Okay. So it's kind of a coordination effort between the front desk and the hygienist. Mm Mm-hmm. And what kind of other questions are you getting from your clients regarding hygiene? Oh, you know, you actually pointed out earlier that, you know, they're having a hard time finding one in the first place right now. And secondly, they're, especially the startups, the brand new ones that have been operating themselves. And when they feel like, okay, their collections are to the point where they think they can bring in a hygienist, they just wonder 
for setting up the goals for the year, basically, how much will this hygiene pr- produce? And, you know, if one third of it is the expense, you know, how should I go about calculating what my net or my bottom line will be? Yeah, uh, well, we can help them with that. And, and you just got to look at, you know, what hygiene salaries are mm-hmm. and multiply that by three and that's their production. And see. you see if that can be sustained in the practice and you add that to the bottom line and it's a mathematical calculation. It's a complicated mathematical calculation. I see. It's not that complicated. That was tongue in cheek, <laughs> really but yes. <laughs> but we can help with that. And then a, a more mature practice that has a hygienist already, how do they know when to add another one? Well, right. again, you look at your active patients, you know, and do the math and figure out how many hygiene days you have. And then how many hygienists do you already have in the practice? Is there an excess? Also, look at your schedule. If you're booked out more than three weeks in hygiene, you need to add somebody. To work that down because people aren't going to wait that long to see the hygienist. They're going to go someplace else. Right, 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 right. And, you know, overall, the overarching rule is that one third of your practice's production should come from the hygiene department. That's correct. And uh, I can tell you in, in our clients, I don't know what percentage, but it's a very low percentage of ours that are actually at that level. I, see. I think universally across the board, almost the vast majority of our clients could improve their hygiene department because most of them are down around 25% and some mm-hmm. are less than that. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've seen and that. That's a lot of money they're leaving on the table. What would be a good way for them to track this? Well, they can track their hygiene production from their daily software, their practice management software. There is a, a day sheet that'll print out the production by provider. Excellent. So right. I would expect, unless you have a shortage of a hygiene provider, I would expect it's a scheduling problem if you're not meeting that one third goal figure, would you say? Or what would be the typical problem for that? It's not typically a scheduling problem so much as some hygienists feel like they're pushing too many procedures if they, you know, it goes back to diagnosing the pocketbook as Mm -hmm. opposed to what's best for the patient. A lot of hygienists are not doing enough perio. Uh, Perio should be about a third of what a hygienist does. And if they have mostly young patients, they're not going to be that much perio. But if they have older patients and they're not doing at least a third or 40%, then they're not aggressively pursuing the procedures that are in the patient's best interest. But they may be afraid to do that because they're afraid the patient will get upset because of the charges and leave the practice. So it's a balancing act. But the hygienist has to have more confidence in what they're doing. I knew that was a problem years ago. Because it was sort of a newer diagnosis at the time, but I thought that we had kind of gotten past that. So it's still an issue. Yes. It's still an issue. Especially with our clients, because so many of our clients are young. And how does that attribute to the problem, do you think? I think they, you know, they're in an early stage of their career. A lot of them are still working on becoming effective leaders. They haven't gotten to the point where... They have added maybe a second hygienist. They're still learning what hygiene should do. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to clients and they don't know that ratio that a hygienist should be producing three times what they make. Mm. And I just assumed that by now everybody knew that. Right. Very basic stat. And and, and some of the younger ones don't. I guess they're just not taught these things in dental school. Right. Clinician work is all they get. Right. And they're good at that. Yeah. Same thing with an associate doctor. When do you bring in another associate doctor? Well, you know, it depends because some doctors are, some owner doctors are capable of producing way more than others. Right. So I can't just throw out one number and say, okay, when your practice production reaches 100,000, you need an associate. That doesn't hold true for everybody. Mm. Because if if you're doing 100,000 a month in production, but some of that is hygiene, a third of that's hygiene, then the doctor's doing... 65,000 or so, well, some docs can do 100,000. Right. And some have trouble getting to 50. So different practices need different, need associates at different times. I see. And there may be other associated expenses related to bringing in an additional provider. That's a great point because I, I, I've had this conversation with a lot of clients too. And, and depending on the practice, if, if they're at, I don't know, maybe 850 or 900,000 a year in production and, and at that point, they probably need an associate and they're thinking about it and they say, okay, I bring in an associate. What's it going to cost me? And one thing I point out to them, it's not only going to cost you the, the, what the associate is, is going to bill, but it's going to co- also cost you probably another chair side assistant for that associate. 
and probably another front desk person to schedule. So if you bring in an associate, you can't really expect to increase your practice from, let's say, 900000 to a million. You're going to lose money. you got to go way beyond that to get back to the efficiencies, the, the, the margin that you should be making. And all the dentists should be taking home at least a third of what they're producing. Yes. Collecting. Sorry about that. <laughs> So they need to be patient to reach that break-even point and understand that this shouldn't affect their ongoing businesses. It's like any business. You have to hire people before you really need them. Mm -hmm. So you hire that associate and you're not going to lose money, but you're not going to make much until they've been there a year or so. Then you're going to become more profitable. I see. So a year or so. Okay. Yes. They have to get that part of the schedule filled, that, that new piece. Yes. And it takes a while to build to that. It does. And you know, then you bring in the marketing. I mean, you've got to you know, hire the associate, bring in the marketing, hire the new people to support the associate. It all goes together. But you could probably hold off on hiring some of those pieces like the additional front desk until that associate gets more full. Yes. Like you don't need them the first day they come in. No. But right. You need to be looking at it. It's a pitfall coming. Yeah. Down the down the pipe. And not only, you know, you hire the associate, you hire the chair side. Eventually you hire the front desk person to support. And then you're going to need that hygienist, that second hygienist, to support the new patient flow. So it all goes together. That's the way you build a practice. I know. That's, <laughs> that's great. You know, I'm learning so much listening to this podcast. You know, this actually brings up the other boring part about this whole uh, topic about adding an additional provider, which is the paperwork part. I also get asked a lot of times... That should I be issuing a 1099 to my hygienist or should I be issuing a W-2? Uh, what would you say to that? Well, unfortunately, I think that differs state to state. But by and large, for the majority of the states, the vast majority of the states, the hygienist is going to need to be paid as a W-2 employee and not contract. There's a few states that allow them to work independently, but not typically. And so as long as you're controlling the work of that hygienist, which you are, it's mm -hmm. your practice, you're going to decide how that person works and what their schedule is and all that sort of thing. So that makes them an employee, has to be paid W-2. That, that piece is pretty cut and dry. I see. And what about associates? Less cut and dry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, again, varies state to state, but a lot more, a lot more variable. So where hy a hygienist... You can pick a state and I can probably be right and say it has to be a W-2. Less sure on an associate, there's a lot more leeway state to state, whether it could be contract or W-2. I see. I, I don't know if the states really govern that. I'm not sure. But I know in Texas that they'll allow the, the associate doctor to be 1099 as long as he has his own entity and he's paying himself through that entity, you know, as, so he's getting payroll, but not directly from the practice he's working for. Right. Now that has been true. I would absolutely concur with that. But there is a new labor rule coming down that may change that substantially where it, it, I suspect within a few years time, all the associates of practices are going to have to be W-2 employees. That's what the, the rule is looking to do. Wow. And I think that's what it's going to accomplish, which is really unfortunate for the associates because they have a lot more leeway if they can be contract employees. There's pros and cons in both directions, but by and large, they're going to be better off if they can be contract. But I think it's going to be not too far future that they're going to have to be employees. But right now in Texas, they can be associates, again, as long as they have their own entity. An individual can't be hired as an associate for the most part. And that be upheld. They would need to be a W-2. So it okay. takes a little work on their part because mm -hmm. they would have to set up an entity and set up their payroll. And right. it's a lot more, you know, legal work for mm -hmm. the associate, but worth it, worth every penny of it and for the most part. So, yeah. But we, we know other states, though, that won't allow it, that they would have to be W-2. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know in some states, hygienists can have their own practice. Right. Uh, Washington, uh, New Mexico. I'm not sure what what other states, but yeah, I'm I think sure there's a lot the of thing. them. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I don't think there's a lot of them. Yeah. For the associates, I think there's more that will allow it. Yeah. Any other clients, uh, questions that you're hearing about uh, this topic, either adding or how to pay? Uh, what about visas? Oh, yes, that do. That does come up sometimes. They do sometimes talk about the work employment visa, if that's something that can be uh, applied for, for an associate that they're bringing in who was probably on an F-1 visa when they were going to school. So what are your thoughts on that? 
I don't know enough about visas to be able to answer that, but I think that one of the first questions the doctor needs to ask the associate is, is what their status is. I see. So they can figure that out and, and, and get a definitive answer whether they're um, allowed to have their own entity. Some visas won't allow you to own your own business. That's correct. Mm-hmm. Well, well, and they it varies. Some can own their own business, but they can't work for it. So there's really a lot of laws, but typically those people will have an immigration attorney and right. that too, then the dentist, the owner dentist needs to be in contact with to get those questions answered. So you would highly recommend contacting an immigration lawyer? I would contact that. the individual. So if you're, if you're thinking of hiring an associate and they have an immigration mm-hmm. issue of some sort, contact their attorney and see what they're allowed to do and not allowed to do and what their visa status is, how long it's expected to stay at that status, things like that. And then reach out to the professionals that you have and see if that's something that will work with your practice or if it's going to cause more trouble than it's worth. And that may not be as big an issue everywhere. I I know it's an issue here. It's Mm -hmm. probably an issue, I'm guessing, in California and Washington. Probably not much of an issue up in Oklahoma. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I think it does vary. The, the bigger and less rural states definitely see more immigration workers with visas than the more rural states. It's just the, the nature of the game. Oh, wow. That's an interesting fact. Yeah. I would agree with that. So at some point, you want to bring in an associate or you have capacity and your practice can't hold physically any more patients. And then what do you do in that case? You mean because of physical space, size? Physical size, mm-hmm. lack of operatories or space. Had that, uh, had that situation yesterday morning <laughs> with a client <laughs> and uh, you build a new office. Oh, okay. <laughs> in her case, you build a new office. We had a client years in the past that solved that problem. And I think it was a rather unique solution, but it was incredibly efficient yeah, there were two doctors. They needed to bring. They were doing. I don't know. Uh, gosh, two million dollars in production out of four operatories. Wow. wow! And the way they solved that was one would work seven to three. The other one worked three to seven. They each had their own staff, and every two weeks they would alternate, so everybody got the same hours. You know, the seven to three went to three to seven, and vice versa. So everybody got the same hours. Huh. So nobody complained that it was unfair that anybody was working more than others, or more mornings or more evenings. Right. But the practice was open twelve hours a day, and they were able to see all the patients. And out of four operatories, they were able, were able to generate uh, over two million dollars in dentistry. Well, and you can accommodate patients that can't come on traditional schedules. Well, those are your most in-demand hours: early morning and late evening. Right. Yeah. That was pretty ingenious. Yeah. It worked great. Yeah. Then they built their own building. Wow. Ultimately, that's the answer. Right. You have to expand. And, uh, and, unless you have space next door. Uh, well, and, and which is rare. In the, uh, in the case of the, the client I talked to yesterday, I think there was a state farm agency next to her. She could not expand into it. Right. They actually owned the building. Uh, no way. So they're not going anywhere. So her only choice was to move. What about the lunchroom? <laughs> Believe it or not, I've actually been asked that. Asked what? If the lunchroom can be converted to the yeah. operatory. Yeah. Uh, if it's plumbed. If it's big enough. If it's plumbed. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> and if it's big enough, it ha- most of the lunchrooms or break rooms that I've seen in dental practices are too narrow to support the uh, full um, suite of equipment right. that they need. Because uh, they have to be a certain measurement. Uh, I don't know what that is. Right. I can't remember. But uh, yeah, it has to be a certain size. But that would be an option. And, and a lot of times there's operatories that haven't been equipped yet. Sure. You know, equip those and gear them up. But if you're just out of physical space, that's a um, short-term solution right. to extend the hours. And, and you hope you don't lose too much morale by taking the break room away from your <laughs> right. snacks. Right. Where are my snacks? <laughs> well, a lot of times I see the doctor's office is plumbed. Mm. Just in case. And so, you know, they give up their office. Mm -hmm. So, yes. I mean, when you build the office, you have to have some foresight to plumb as many rooms because it's it's, it's never as inexpensive to plumb the rooms as it is at the beginning. Right. That's a great tip. If you have to go back and plumb them later, it just costs way more than it should. And the plumbing goes overhead instead of under the slab. Wow. So. So speaking of, you know, cost saving tips, when would be a good time for our clients to look into furnishing their operatories like during the year? Is there a special sweet time period when they get more discounts? You know, so as far as timing, the doctors ask me that question sometimes. And my first question back to them is, 
are you thinking of tax savings or do you really need this equipment for patient treatment? <laughs> right. If they need it for patient treatment, buy it. Mm-hmm. Okay. If they need it for tax savings, then we have to determine whether December or January is a better month to buy it in. As far as getting discounts, mm-hmm. they can get discounts probably if they go most of the time, used in the old days, pre-pandemic, I the, uh, the old days. <laughs> the old days. Pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic. <laughs> if you went to a dental show, you could get discounts. So we have clients flying to Chicago to the midwinter up there. We had clients going to the Southwest Dental Conference in Dallas, the TDA Conference in May, and they would get discounts on their purchases then. Now, post-pandemic, I don't think any of the dental shows have started back up. No. Mm-hmm. But I know some of the Shine, Patterson, Benko, some of the major suppliers are offering discounts in lieu of the dental shows. Oh, wow. So, so, so you have to ask. Okay. So you have to be proactive. You have to ask. ask. I would just like to say, I really appreciate your enthusiasm, Robert, that we sit here in first quarter of 2021 and you're calling it post pandemic. That's very <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> I, don't know what to, I don't know what to say to that. I think mid, I think we're still mid, unfortunately, but I like to think of it as post pandemic. I guess I've been reading too much news lately. That's I'm good. I, I haven't read news at all because yeah, it's, stressful. Yeah. So, so I should be optimistic and looking ahead from what you see. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, great. The number of cases are dropping. Thank you. Vaccines are out. That's what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anything else I can answer for you? No, that was all. I mean, you touched upon most of the major points that my clients were asking me and I'm sure uh, the questions that our office gets to our email. So thank you so much for sharing that with our listeners. It was sure. great having you here. Great. And you too, Lynn. Thank you. And hopefully we'll have another great episode for you guys the next time. Till then, take care. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for listening today. Be sure to subscribe to Beyond Bite Wings on your favorite podcast platform. For more info, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, or reach out to us on our website. You can also shoot us an email at info at eandassociates.com.